we were looking at a question. I'm not going to give you a big introduction today. I just want to jump right in. We, we were looking at a question. Here's the question that we were looking at when we were studying uh, this section of the book of Romans. Uh, Paul is uh, asking this particular question. It's behind the, the passage, as it were. He's asking a simple question, like, what are the reasons? He's, he wants to come to Rome to, to impact the church there. And he's posing this type of question. What are the reasons, that, like somebody like a Paul, would be motivated to share the gospel? What are the motivating reasons? The, uh, what's, what's behind the passion that Paul has? And so uh, in verses 16 and 17, which are in many respects like the hinge on a door, uh, so they are the key uh, focus of the book. The, in fact, the entire book of Romans is going to be about verses 16 and 17, which is about the gospel. Uh, and so they're very important verses. So that's why we've slowed down and st- has spent several weeks on studying them. But he's going to give you, if you look at the word for, as it appears there, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, then for it is the power of God to salvation. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God. Uh, the word for in the Greek text is the word gar. And gar, when placed at the beginning of a sentence like that, uh, has a couple of lexical options. Uh, one of them uh, is that it's stating the reason for whatever the author is trying to prove. It's like a legal uh, argument in a, in a courtroom. And Paul's telling you, these are the reasons why I am motivated to share the gospel of Christ. Uh, and by way of review, uh, the reason number one is, uh, he tells us in verse 16 that the gospel is preeminent. There's no other gospel like it. There's false gospels in our world. There's a plethora of them. Uh, gospels masquerading as the gospel which can save. Uh, and there's lots of well-meaning people that believe those false gospels. But Paul says, as for me, I'm motivated to share this gospel uh, about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah, Jesus, uh, because it is the preeminent good news for mankind. Um, I spent yesterday afternoon with a friend of mine. Uh, she lives in Malibu on the beach. Um, nice lady. She owns a company that stores things seized by the IRS or the Secret Service uh, or U.S. Customs uh, on like five western states. And so my father, when he was a federal agent and he retired. Uh, this is who he worked with, one of the people that he worked with. As he, like he, he stored Ted Kaczynski's house when they uh, seized the Unabomber's uh, place. Uh, she had this in one of her 100,000 square foot vaults. But she's a Jew. She's not a Christian. Uh, she knew my dad, and my dad had a great impact on her life. Uh, and then the Lord took him home before I moved here. And then we've kept this relationship going because uh, uh, of the bond she had with my dad. Now, we have that bond. It's a wonderful thing to be friends. But but, uh, she told me yesterday at lunch, and we spent most of the afternoon at a restaurant downtown, just took up a corner of a little restaurant, and we sat there. We hadn't seen each other in 10 years. We've talked, but we haven't seen each other. So me and Liz and our friend Randy uh, were down there talking, and half of our conversation was of theology. And it was very interesting, because I'm the Gentile who knows Hebrew, and has degrees in this stuff. And she's like, you know more about the Torah than I do. And uh, so, like, what are your questions? And so we had lots of questions. And she finally admitted to me, it was very interesting. She, she said, I, um, I'm not an atheist. I'm, I, I guess I just, I just don't know if there's enough evidence to believe that there is a God. So I said, well, then you're an agnostic. You just don't know. Uh, she said, yeah. And she said, I wouldn't mind knowing if there was proof to convince me of that. And I said, well... We could have that discussion. <laughs> and so I told her, I said, you know, we're, I'm doing a, a series uh, here in, um, it's in your bulletin, I think, in, uh, um, I think it's the second week of February, uh, on the proofs of the presence, the four major arguments for the existence of God, the philosophical arguments. And you can't ironclad prove the existence of God, but you can give good logical reasons why you should. And so I said, would you be interested in, um, in me sending you my entire seminar? She goes, absolutely. So you think I'm going to, like, debate whether I should or shouldn't? No, absolutely. I'm hitting go on that one. And she said she's going to read it, and she will. She's an attorney. I'm sure she'll evaluate it. But she was here because her friend, uh, another attorney uh, with um, uh, his wife and family, they were here. He was arguing a case at the Supreme Court. So she came to hear him uh, uh, present his case before the Supreme Court. That's why she was here. So we had a wonderful time uh, talking about family and everything, but, but theology. I'm excited. I'm motivated to share the gospel with my Jewish friend. Why? Who's Jesus? Who's Yeshua? Well, he was a Jew, but he was the God-man. And he fulfills all Messianic prophecies. He's the Messiah, and you need to know him. He's the Savior. So that gospel is preeminent. That gospel is also powerful, as we saw in verse 16. It's the power of God. For what? For salvation. It's that, in fact, Yeshua, his name, Yasha, in Hebrew, means to save. He's the Savior. From what? Sin. 
We're all born with the sin of Adam, uh, and he saves from the sin of Adam because he's the greater Adam, as Paul will argue in Romans chapter 5. But that's all just review stuff. We want to get on to the sermon. Point three, reasons why you want to share the gospel, is it's purifying. That's what we're going to talk about in verse 17. Notice what he says. He says, for in it, the gospel that he's talking about, uh, is the righteousness of God. It is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. Then he's going to quote from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. He says, let me prove to you that that the gospel is all about faith, not about works. He quotes from Habakkuk and, and says, but the righteous man shall live by what? Faith plus works? No. Faith. Faith. He should live by faith. Uh, Profound works uh, uh, don't get the attention of God. He looks at the work of Jesus Christ. That's what the Father looks at. And so Paul's uh, picking up a motif that uh, Jesus developed in in Matthew chapter uh, 7, verse 13, where Christ uh, explained basically man's predicament and the way out of that predicament. Matthew chapter 7, uh, the closing out of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says this. He says, uh, you have two options. He says, you can enter by the narrow gate... Why? Well, for wide is the, the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, eternal destruction. And many are those who enter by it, but the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. If you are those that find it. He says, you're, on, you're born on the road that's broad road, the road to uh, damnation, judgment. Everyone's born on that road, edemic sin from Adam. We can't escape it. But he said, if you want to switch to the road of life, we realize it's a very narrow path. Is Christianity exclusive? Is it exclusive? Absolutely. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. It's very exclusive. Do I make it exclusive? No. I'm merely like a waiter at a restaurant showing up and telling you there's the meal. And he's, that's it. Uh, it's very exclusive. It's not open to multiple ways up the mountain to truth. And so Paul is uh, piggybacking on what Jesus is saying. And he's saying the gospel that saves and gets you off the, this wide path and on the, the narrow path that few are on because the majority want their own path over here. Uh, the way you switch paths is you got to come on God's terms through his gospel and, and, and get his righteousness, not your righteousness. Now, the problem with our world is there's false gospels all around us. They're everywhere. Uh, and they have, you might know these people. Many of them are very nice people. Very, some of them are more moral than Christians, which is sad. Uh, but it doesn't change truth. But there's many people in false uh, systems of belief that believe that their system will save them. And they all have the same kind of components about them. And I'll illustrate those in just a minute. But one of the components that all false systems have about how to switch paths to the path of death, to the path of life, uh, all do this one thing. You must believe in God, whoever he or she may be. You must have faith. And you must have perpetual works. There is not any false system that does not believe that. They all have that component about them. Belief in God regard, regarding who he, he or she, and it's she now in our culture, whoever he or she may be. And you must perpetually work. Um, to finish out my doctorate in apologetics, I have to take two classes. Uh, they're both on cults. Uh, so there's cult A, cult B. Uh, and so I'm, uh, I was in class all last week from 6 to 10.30 every night. Yesterday there was class. Um, and, and then I'm doing this independent study on uh, Jehovah's Witness thinking and, and Mormon thinking in an advanced cult class. So for those classes, I've had to, you have to read all, in doctoral work, you have to read the original source material. And I've read these kind of writings because I have Jehovah's Witnesses in my family. A lot of my friends in California that I grew up with are Mormons. I, I understand their systems. I've talked to both of them. But I've never sat down and read all of their writings straight through. I studied them, but never sat down and read them all the way through. So during Christmas, I read the Book of Mormon. I read the Doctrines and Covenants, and I read the Pearl of Great Price, in addition to articles of faith and other things that I was reading. I was busy. Uh, And as I was reading, I was taking notes. Um, Is this true? Is this not true? They claim it's the the new restored gospel. Is it? Uh, And so I began to read it. And these are some of the notes that I took, because notice what they do with the Doctrine of Salvation. Remember? Uh, a false system of belief, no matter how well many the people are, believes in God, whoever the he, may, he or she may be, plus you must work your way into the presence of God. That is not the gospel. Case in point, uh, the book of Ether in the book of Mormon, um, chapter 9, verse 26 says this about getting in you know, from one path to the other. Wherefore, I, Moroni, the uh, exalted angel, uh, command, was commanded to write these things that evil may be done away and that the t- 
time may come that Satan may have no power upon uh, the hearts of the children of men, but that they might be persuaded to do good, how often? Continually. I underlined this. But that they may come, if they do continually, why? Notice that word. He's going to say the reason why you must do this. That you may come into the fountain of all righteousness and be what? Saved. Is that the gospel? No. 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 So I made a notation, and I was reading through the book. It's like, that's interesting. That's not the gospel. They claim it's the restored gospel. That was never the gospel of the gospels. Interesting. I must do good continually. What's it, what's it saying? The antithesis of this is, if I do not continually do what you said I must do, unsaved. then I'll be unsaved. Uh, do they believe you have to have faith? Absolutely. I was reading the Book of Mormon, the Book of Nephi, uh, chapter 9, verse 18. I have to give you all this stuff because I read all these things, Okay. Because I, thanks, yeah. Because you may have friends that are in these systems. Uh, Nephi chapter 9, verse 18, here's what it says about faith. Uh, but behold, the righteous, the saints of the Holy One of Israel, and they borrow the terminology from the book of Isaiah to hook you in. Uh, they who have believed in the Holy One of Israel, uh, they would have endured crosses of the world and despised the shame of it. They shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. So he's saying here, you should have faith. I would agree. If you want to get into God's presence, you got to have faith. But they add things to it. Uh, leave, the doc, doc, leave the doctrine of the Book of Mormon behind. Move to Doctrines and Covenants. Uh, section 1, very first chapter, verse 32, says this. Nevertheless, he that repents and does, present tense, the commandments of the Lord... Cause effect, effect is, shall be forgiven. What's the antithesis? And he that repents not, from him shall be taken, even from the white which he has received. For my spirit shall not always strive with man, saith the Lord of hosts. If you, you believe in me, and you perpetually do the works that I call you to do, you'll gain entrance into life. If you believe in me, and you do not do the works that I tell you, even what you might have, I take away from you and you're lost. You know, I don't know about you, but that leads to despair. Because why? You'll never know. If you've ever done enough, I move on. Uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 5, verse 21. Now I command you, my servant Joseph, Joseph Smith, to do what? Well, to repent and walk more uprightly before me and yield to the compassions, compassions or persuasions of men no more. And that you should be firm, that's a key word, in keeping, present tense, the commandments wherewith I have commanded you. And if you, notice the conditional clause, and if you do this, there's a then clause, apodosis, apodosis. If you do this, behold, I grant you eternal life. Cause effect. Even if you should be slain, if you do not believe and continually perpetuate the commandments, you shall not have X over here. You don't have salvation. Is that the gospel? Is the gospel about belief in God and then perpetual performance? No. It's about the work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what matters most. See, if you could work your way into the heavens uh, based on your faith in God and, and your works, why did Jesus bother even coming then? See, here's the components of systems that are false systems, even though their people might be extremely nice and well-meaning and do benevolent things in the culture, no doubt. But is it a true system? Well, all false systems have four components, primary components. Number one, uh, they diminish the word of God. That's what they do. They, they're going to say, oh, you have your Bible. Well, but it's full. Of, it has 2,000 trans, It's 2,000 errors in the manuscripts. Because, there's two, we, because of that, we can't trust it. But you can trust our translation. Would you have viable documents to back up your translation? No, they were taken into heaven. How convenient. <laughs> Just that's a whole other discussion. Uh, number two, uh, they diminish the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Well, you need to believe in God. Yeah, Jesus is... You know, he's like in Jehovah's Witness thinking, he's a God, but he's not God. And then in Mormonism, well, he's just an elevated man who became God, one of many gods, because they believe in many gods. Uh, so they diminish the person in the work of Jesus, because you can work your way into God's presence by your works. Number three, they have a prophet or prophets who give you added revelation. Oh, you've got prophets that give you the book of the Bible, but we have new prophets that give you more revelation that's even better insight into what God was saying. Here's the thing. Remember laws of logic? We've talked about this before. No one remembers. Okay, great, fantastic. I'm doing an awesome job. Uh, <laughs> when you look at the laws of logic, the very first law of logic, you cannot even, if you're an attorney, you can't even show up in court if you do not understand the law of non-contradiction. It's the first principles, according to Aristotelian logic, of all logic. What's it say? Law of non-contradiction. You cannot have two diametrically opposed viewpoints to be true at the same way, at the same way and in the same sense. 
impossible. What is he talking about? Well, uh, if I say I believe in gravity and you say, hey, man, I'm convinced there's no gravity, we can prove the positions. We, there's a little staircase that leads to the roof. We get up there. I challenge you, go first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the hospital visitation, funeral, whatever, because I'm pretty sure based on Aristotelian logic, not rules of non-contradiction, that you, there's either gravity or there's no gravity. You can't say that in our cosmos, they're both true at the same time. It's impossible. You cannot say there is a gospel that saves based on faith in Jesus' work, and there's a gospel that says your faith, well, you're, that's okay to a point, but you need to do all these other things. One's true, one's not true. What do cults do? They diminish the personal work of Jesus. They have a new prophet or prophets, which give you new prophecy. Here's my point. As I'm reading through all these, these books, and now I'm reading all the Jehovah's Witness uh, doctrinal books because I've moved on to the next class. Um, it's interesting because I'm asking myself, they're claiming a new gospel is a restored gospel, but why is it diametrically opposed to the gospel of the gospels? Based on Aristotelian logic, what principle? Law of non-contradiction. That can't, one's true, one's false. Number four, they without exception diminish salvation by grace through faith. All of them. All false systems diminish salvation by grace. Why? They want you to work to perform to get into God's presence. That's how you control people. You know, the gospel is not about that at all. That's what Paul is going to say. It's not about that at all. He's going to say, I stand, stand sure-footed on the gospel. Uh, what is it? He said, I'm not ashamed of it. It's God's power to salvation, etc. And then as, as he shows us here in this passage, he says this, this gospel, uh, in it is the righteousness of God in this gospel. What does he mean by righteous? This gospel that leads to righteousness. We want to talk about that. It's a gospel of righteousness, true righteousness. We're going to look at three things about the righteousness that Paul talks about here. Number one, I'm going to look at what I would label the meaning of righteousness. Because when I grew up in the 60s, uh, I was born in the late 60s, 50s, but in the 60s when I was growing up, in the 70s, that word righteous was like the word, like the righteous brothers. <laughs> Heavy metal band, remember them? <laughs> uh, not really. Guys with some guitars had some great songs. Yeah, you remember them? I loved them. Yeah, righteous brothers. My grandma had a little uh, record player. Uh, you could stick the 78 in there and, you know, put it on one record, and I would, you know, play with my little toys, and I'd listen to the righteous brothers. This is awesome. Um, were they righteous? Like, what's that mean when it says they were the righteous brothers? I don't know. It just sounded cool. Um, then that word became a, like a term for cool, didn't it? Yeah. Because if you met somebody, I mean, I had a lot of hippie friends. Remember hippies? I had a ton of them. Yeah. And I go to my friend's house, you know, hang out with them. You know, the beads in the doorway, the black lights, the posters, Jimi Hendrix music, you know, and the whole shebang. Incense burning. Like, what's the smell for? Hey, man, it's just incense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something else is going on in here. These are my friends. And my dad's a federal agent. Um, <laughs> so my friends would say, hey man, that dude is, he's just totally righteous. Yeah, man, he is righteous. Did that mean that hippie guy smoking bad stuff, that he was spiritually holy? Uh, I think he was the antithesis of holy. But don't you remember the word righteous when it was like the cool term? Now, now what is it? Who knows? Oh, intolerance, no. Yeah, may, may be, you know. Yeah, but, but that, that, you know, right, what does it mean to be righteous? Well, here's what it means lexically, what the word means, the Greek word, uh, which reflects the, the, the Hebrew word, sadik. Uh, uh, Dikasune is the Greek word, but what does it mean? Here's what it means. It means to conform to a norm, even rhymes. Did you hear me? It conforms to a norm. What's that mean? Okay, um, when I moved here 10 years ago from California, uh, and Liz and I were looking around for houses, and we finally bought a house, and we're moving in. I'm kind of looking around at the neighborhoods as she is, and I'm like, okay, this is weird. I mean, like, they don't have fences here. I'm serious. We had this discussion. We're driving around looking at homes. It's like, what's with these people? I mean, where we came from, it's like everything is squared off with a fence. Uh, and so we bought a house where the neighborhoods, there's no fences. And so I've told you this before, and I just remind you, because I have to have an illustration that illustrates this point. I, I, I started, I was a former landscaper, so I started building a fence when I got my house. My neighbors don't have fences. So I hand dug the 19 holes with a digging bar and, and, and a you know, post hole digger, dug all my holes, ran all my lines, started bringing all the four by four posts in, etc. Do you think I just eyeballed everything? 
Is someone else? You think I just sat back and looked at the four by four post and went, yeah, it's looking good to me. <laughs> Set the cement, you know, pour it in there. No, I had a really big level. And I would put that post in there and I put that, uh, that level on there at all different angles to make sure that thing is set straight. That level was the norm. What was I doing? Adjusting to the norm. I could stand back and go, that fence is righteous. <laughs> it's true. Now think about that. Like, why did that word become a word used of theology? Because God's the level. See? He says, oh, you want to get into my presence? Here's the gospel. It's the, it's the norm. You match this, you're good. You're righteous. Now, there's two lexical meanings to the word righteous. You could argue three, but this third point's redundant. So I just, I'm just going to say there's two. Um, number one, it can, it can emphasize practice. And this is where cultic false teachings go off base because the Bible does talk about practice leads to righteousness. They just confuse that with salvation. A case in point, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Notice what Paul says. After giving some things that you need to stop doing as Christians, he says, but flee from these things. Don't entertain them. Flee, translated, run from these things, you man of God, and pursue what? Righteousness. So it, does a Christian already have righteousness? Yes or no? Yeah, they have righteousness. What kind of righteousness? Read 1 Corinthians 1.30. At the moment of salvation, you're given the righteousness of Christ. Positional righteousness. The problem, as I said during communion, is practice. You're, what is spirituality? Matching my practice with my position. That's holiness. But, but, but there is a practical pursuit of righteousness. But that is not how Paul is using that terminology in, in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Because that would make the gospel based on works. Which is not the gospel. So to understand the, the concept of the second lexical meaning, uh, you have to read a couple of uh, Greek lexicons, and I'll give them to you, uh, several of them, four, four to be exact. Uh, the second emphasis of the word righteous can mean, number one, uh, to render just or innocent. It's a legal term. You're guilty, and they, they render you in a court of law just or innocent. Uh, it can denote being acquitted, being pronounced and treated as righteous. Three, the word can denote uh, to declare worthy, to declare guiltless, to judge, to declare, pronounce righteous, therefore acceptable. Or four, it can denote the act of clearing someone of transgression, to acquit, to set free, to remove guilt, acquittal. <laughs> one is about performance, one's about position. Because if you show up in a court of law and the judge brings a gavel down and says, uh, you're acquitted, you're free, right? Now I completely understand this because I've... I've I've committed one crime in my lifetime that I know of. I didn't know I did it when I did it. You ever done that? You're just not going to say. I always confess so much at church, you know. Uh, well, I did. When I first moved here, uh, you know, I'm raised in a law enforcement family, love to abide by the law. I'm a major law person. Ask my wife. I love rules. I love following them. Uh, so I move here. Somebody, somebody come to our church, says, come and hey, would you marry our, our daughter and uh, future son-in-law? So absolutely. I've done weddings for 25 years. So I, I did the wedding. I, I got the form out after the wedding. I walked over to the couple uh, to have them sign their part. And then I went down to sign my part uh, with the father-in-law. Uh, in, in and, uh, <laughs> and it says, your name, Martin Baker. I've done this for like 25 years, you know, Martin Baker, uh, church, Burke Community Church. Uh, Virginia ministerial license number. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> From California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have one of those. You know? And... Uh, so I went over to the father, and I said, hey, there's an issue. He goes, what's the issue? I'm not legal. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean you're not legal? I'm not legal. I don't have one of those numbers. I mean, I thought California had a lot of rules and regulations. Virginia has, the, they're off the grid. You got to have a Virginia ministerial license to license people? Yeah. I, okay. I told him, you need to go tell them they're not legal. <laughs> so I'm not telling them. I'm like, I'm not telling them. We're not telling them. <laughs> Somebody didn't tell them. <laughs> they, they went on their honeymoon. <laughs> this is one of those judgment calls as a pastor. They went, they went on their honeymoon, and I was not legal. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, while they're on their honeymoon, I'm going down to the courthouse, and I'm going to clear this up. I mean, this is ridiculous. So I go down there, I go to the window they told me to go to, and I'm standing there, and there's a lady there. You know how they like have no emotion? You know, they've seen a lot of you, criminals. And I'm sitting, 
My dad puts people in these places. That's how I grew up. So I'm standing there. I'm like, I don't believe this. So I'm standing there, and the lady goes, yes, name, you know, Martin Baker. Yeah, you know, basically crime, you know. Um, well, I, I, uh, I married a couple. Uh, I don't have a license. You don't have a license? No, I, I don't. Okay, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's not appropriate. Um, uh, she's like, a, there's a, there's a, there's a you, have, you got to pay a fine. Excuse me? She goes, well, you, this is against the law. You have to pay a fine. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you, sir. It's going to be 90 bucks. $90 for what? Um, anyway, not a great place to debate at the window there, but <laughs> she said, sir, you're going to have to pay the $90 or you don't get a license to marry anybody ever. I'm like, okay, here's the $90. Uh, and I said, okay, thanks. Great. Uh, you know, give me the, what forms I need. And she goes, oh, you're not done. I go, well, what are you talking about? She goes, you got to go to court. <laughs> what? Court for what? You know, sometimes it's hard to stop talking. I mean, <laughs> like, I go, what are I going to go to court for? She goes, well, th- you've, this is an infraction. You've got to go see the judge. He's got to fix it. I go, this is great. So that when the couple came back from their honeymoon, I called them up and told them, well, could we talk? Could you come to my office? <laughs> <laughs> so they came to my office. I broke the news to them. You know, I'm not legal. You're not legal. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And the judge says, you have to come with me. Unbelievable. So there came the day. They put me on the docket. And I, I go down there. Courtroom's packed. There was a really nasty case in front of us. It was brutal. I'm listening. Oh, this is like terrible. Uh, and then when they finished that case, then the, and they we're sitting there with all these people. And then whoever it is that's the bailiff, whoever gets up and says, you know, the state of Virginia against Martin Baker for... <laughs> His infringement upon them, marital, you know, licensing ceremonies or whatever it was. I'm like, can I just crawl under the chair? And then the judge starts laughing. And then the, ju- and then the judge says, uh, Mr. Baker, could you approach the bench? No, no, I'm no. And he's like, could you bring the, mar- the young couple with you? I'm like, are you kidding me? So I go up there and he, he's, you know, he's elevated. You're down, he's up. And I'm sitting there, this is ridiculous. And, uh, and he looks at me and he goes, um, Hey, I tell you what, I'll, I'll just show you grace today, and I'm just going to take this little stamp thing here, put my name here and there, stamp this, stamp that, I'm just going to backdate it as if you were legal at the moment. Can you live with that? All day. <laughs> Can I have my $90 back? You know? <laughs> and then he added this one little proviso, which I thought was totally funny. He says, uh, hey, do you realize that I just did a wedding for a niece of mine in Chicago, real, and I did the wedding, and I wasn't legal in Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to my sermon. <laughs> what, were we, what were we talking about? We're talking about acquittal. What's righteousness mean? You're a sinner. You got acquitted in God's courtroom. How do you get acquitted? Do you think you stand there and say, oh, I had faith in you, but man, check out my works. What's he going to say? No acquittal. See, you only get acquitted when you come by faith. Not your works. Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 5, Paul says, but to the one who does not work, But believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as what? Righteousness. Righteousness. This is how Abraham became righteous. Faith in God made him righteous. Not not Abraham's works. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. Notice what Paul says. He says, when I I look at my life and my faith and everything, he says, here's how I, I perceive things. That I might be found in him, Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, how I used to live, faith in God plus performance, Judaism. Uh, that, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness was, which comes from God on the basis of faith and you might add only faith. Paul says, I used to think I was getting into heaven because I believed in God and I performed righteous moral works. That did not save me because I didn't know God who is the righteous one. I have to stop and ask you before we move on. Um, are you righteous? With his righteousness, not yours. Next thing I want to look at is uh, what I would call the master of the righteousness. It kind of dovetails right into that because Paul says this righteousness is of God. Uh, grammatically, it's called the genitive of possession. God owns it. Why does he own it? Well, it's, it's kind of a, he's the essence of righteousness. He's not just own it. It's him. It's the essence of who he is. I asked one of my professors uh, who, uh, Dr. Hartley, John Hartley, uh, was educated at Brandeis. I asked him one day in class, I said, Dr. Hartley, if you had to reduce the character of God down to one key characteristic, I know he's, he's, he's all of them at the same time, but if you had intrinsically him, he said the holiness of God. He's holy. He's holy. See, he's righteous. That's what the scriptures teach. Psalm 119, 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright. 
Psalm 129, the Lord is righteous. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 in the New Testament, my little children, I'm writing you, you these things that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he's speaking to a Christian, you have an advocate, a defense attorney. Who's that? Jesus the righteous. My position is secure before God. My practice gets messed up occasionally, but when I appear before God to confess my sin, who steps in as my defense attorney? Jesus Christ. I tell you, there's no better place to be. Because if you don't know him, he's not your defense attorney. You're on your own. I was cruising around the other day and I ran into this picture. It's kind of interesting. And I'll explain it to you in just a minute. What is that guy doing? And why? Okay, there are people, and I was just surfing around at lunch, you know, just looking at stuff, and I, and I bumped into some of this stuff. There's people that descend into active volcanoes to take photographs. Okay, I'm a pretty logical person. When I saw this, I just asked the simple question, why? <laughs> why? What's inside of a volcano? Lava. Lava. What color is it? Red. Probably red. It might be black, but underneath that, it's red. It's very hot. And if you get really close to it, Death. Yeah, it's, all, it's over, you know. And so I know what's in there. So like, who would want a close-up of that? There's people. There's people. So they developed what are called proximity suits for things like this. And so these proximity suits, you put them on, uh, and you can descend down, as this guy's doing down into the volcano, to take some really, I guess, awesome shots. Uh, but I'm just with my logical mind thinking, who was the first guy to descend? <laughs> well, you know, Harry got down 100 feet and gone. We got to devise that suit. It wasn't good enough. Who's next? <laughs> not, not me. Not me. But anyway, I'm just thinking as I'm eating lunch. And then it dawns on me, this is theology personified. Is it not? Because I've read the Old and New Testament uh, all my life, and I keep bumping into Exodus 24, 17, Deuteronomy 5, 24, Psalm 97, 3, Hebrews 12, 29, that God is a consuming fire. His holiness is fire. When Isaiah sees him in Isaiah 6, Isaiah, the prophet of God, sees him and says, woe is me. Why? I'm an unclean man because I've now seen God in his holiness. He's a consuming fire, which leads to a logical question at lunchtime. How's the sinner? Get into the holy presence of God. Well, you need a proximity suit. What's it made out of? His righteousness, not yours. You get it? His righteousness, not yours. What's man's problem? Uh, he has what's called sin all about him. He is depraved. All different levels, but he's depraved. Uh, and John Calvin was, was right in articulating that whole concept of the tulip concept. Uh, the first point of the acronym being total depravity. Man is totally depraved. At all different levels, but at his base core, he is depraved. As I've told you before, if you do not believe in that man is depraved, have a child. <laughs> Why? I mean, it's an ultimate illustration. Why? Who sits down and gives them lessons on stuff that's devious? Do you? I mean, who teaches them? <laughs> what, what are they? <laughs> Why are you laughing? I mean, they just know how to lie. They know how to deceive. They know how to blame other people when they're at, at fault. They know all this stuff. Did they take a class? I'm out, you're getting quiet. Why? How do they come out that way? Ad Adam's sin is all about them. They're depraved. They come out that way. What are you trying to do as a parent? Help them not be that way. It's a spiritual problem. What do they need? The righteousness of God. That saves them. That saves them. Jesus says uh, through Paul's pen, you need my righteousness. You need my righteousness. And when you put that proximity suit on of my righteousness, you can stand in my presence for all eternity and it's an awesome relationship because your sin is covered. Which leads to the last thing about righteousness. It's magnificent. It is magnificent. There's nothing like it. Notice what Paul says. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it's written, the just shall live by faith. This is kind of a complex sentence in Greek. And so there's different ways to translate it. Um, here's how the NIV, that's the NAS, New American Standard. Here's how the NIV translates it which I think is closer to the grammar. It says, for in the gospel of righteousness, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, meaning it's perpetually there. What, what they're getting at is this. The, the word, when it says that the righteousness of, of God is revealed, is as a present tense thing. He's saying God's righteousness his, in the gospel is in a constant state of being revealed. It's a... Uh, it's that word from which we would get uh, apocalypto, that kind of a revelation. It's something that's hidden. 
He said it's constantly being disclosed, present tense, and then he uses a present passive verb for this, which means the subject, man, is being acted upon by an outside force. Who's the outside force? God. What's he doing? He's saying, I don't want you to get caught up in a false system of gospel. I'm going to make sure that you know what the true gospel is in your lifetime. I'm going to bring it your way. I'm going to reveal it to you. Then you have a choice. Broad path, narrow path. It's being revealed. And Paul says, if you don't think that the gospel is all related to faith and not works, then he said, you forgot about what, well, what Habakkuk learned. When God told Habakkuk, I'm going to bring the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and Israel. And Habakkuk had a problem with that. God tells Habakkuk, trust me, have faith. I know what I'm doing. Paul says, when it comes to the gospel, God's saying the same thing. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. It's got nothing to do with your personal works. It's got everything to do with the work of my son. So how does God reveal his gospel to you? How'd you hear? Well, uh, I listened to, to lots of things as a child. My parents, uh, family says they talk, members as they talked, uh, pastors that talked to me, etc. hymns that I sang at church. I listened to all those things. God got my attention and he was telling me, I'm here and that's my gospel. Do you believe it? One old song that I heard as a child was, went, went like this. Up Calvary's mountain when dreadful morn walked Christ my Savior. He was weary and warm, facing for sinners death on the cross that he might save them from endless loss. I remember singing songs like that thinking, that's me. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer. Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blighting and heeding. Who was he dying for? Dying for me. I mean, I was a kid. I stuck my name in there. I could hear him calling me. He, I'm dying for you, Marty. See, it's not your works, it's my work. The righteousness of God comes by faith, not by works. It's what the entire book of Revelation or Romans is about. Do you have faith in Christ as the Savior? It is that which redeems and gives a person absolutely forgiveness and eternal life.